Viscosity acts as a sort of internal friction in fluids when there are internal heterogeneities of velocity. The result is the transfer of momentum within fluids from regions of high velocity, and therefore momentum, to regions of slower velocity, and therefore lower momentum. Animals and plants, which are comparatively solid in comparison with fluids, are embedded in fluid environments. Viscosity is involved in transferring momentum from fluids to objects embedded in them. These objects can be animals, plants, trees, what have you. It's worth pointing out that this all depends upon relative motions of fluids and solid objects. Momentum can be transferred from a moving fluid to a stationary object, as when wind flows past a tree. Momentum can also be transferred through viscosity from a moving object through a stationary fluid, as in a fish gliding through the water. Or it can be transferred between a moving object and a moving fluid, as long as the velocities of the two are different. Whatever the context, the interaction between surfaces and fluids produces a phenomenon known as a boundary layer, which can be understood as the outcome of momentum transfer between fluids and surfaces. The term boundary layer refers to a region of interaction between a moving fluid and a surface. Let's start by considering two parcels of fluid, both traveling at the same velocity and therefore carrying the same momentum. The differential of velocity between these two parcels is zero, and the differential in momentum is likewise zero. These parcels of fluid are said to be traveling in the free stream. Let's now imagine a surface of something embedded in the fluid. There will be a parcel of fluid that sits on top of that surface. At this level, the parcel of fluid is stuck to the surface so that the velocity is equal to zero, as is the momentum. This is known as the no-slip condition. The no-slip condition means that there is now a difference of velocity between the parcels of fluid far away from the surface in the free stream and at the surface where the momentum is zero. There will therefore be some transfer of momentum between the fluid in the free stream and the surface. But remember that fluids are continuous. The momentum transfer will not happen in one large leap, but will be transferred downward through adjacent parcels of fluid all the way down to the surface. With any downward transfer of momentum, the velocity will diminish slightly. The result is a gradient in velocity that extends down to zero at the surface. If we connect the heads of the velocity vectors with a continuous line, we get what's called a velocity profile, outlined here in blue. This gradient in velocity is known as the boundary layer and it comes about by the continuous transfer of momentum from fluid in the free stream to a surface. The momentum imparted to the surface imposes a force that is oriented parallel to the fluid's velocity. Let's look at the boundary layer a bit more formally. The boundary layer is indicated by a plot between velocity of the fluid on the x-axis and the height above the surface on the y-axis. At zero height, the velocity is zero, this is just a restatement of the no-slip condition. With increasing height above the ground, the velocity increases until it asymptotically reaches the free stream velocity. At this point, flow velocity remains the same, no matter how high you measure. In terms of momentum transfer, what matters here is the shear rate, gamma. This is simply the first derivative of the velocity, dv over dh indicated by the tangent line of the velocity curve. There's something to note here that might help avoid confusion. The shear rate is dv over dh, that is dx over dy. When you learned about first derivatives and tangents in calculus, you probably learned the first derivative as dy over dx, that is the differential of the dependent variable y over the independent variable x. Our boundary layer plot essentially reverses this, plotting the dependent variable velocity on the horizontal axis and the independent variable height on the vertical axis. The reason we're doing it this way is more tradition than anything. Meteorologists have long plotted the boundary layer as height versus velocity. Just keep this in mind 
and what follows will make a lot more sense. Okay, back to the boundary layer. At the free stream velocity, shear rate is minimized to zero. This makes sense. Once the velocity reaches free stream, there is no difference of velocity with respect to height, and shear rate will therefore be zero. Within the boundary layer, shear rate increases until it's maximized at the ground surface. This means there is very little vertical transfer of momentum outside the boundary layer, while the vertical transfer of momentum is maximized closer to the ground. In the real world, which is what we're interested in here in this course, boundary layers interact with real objects of finite size. This adds an additional wrinkle to how boundary layers behave in the real world. Imagine a flat plate of length s. We're designating this length as s because this is something called the characteristic dimension of the plate. Let's say that there is a wind that flows parallel to the plate at velocity v sub fs, so called because this is essentially the free stream velocity. As the wind encounters the plate, shear forces will develop between the stationary plate and the moving wind. There will develop a characteristic velocity gradient in the wind speed with respect to height off the leaf surface, which we're plotting as little boundary layer plots. These gradients will get longer the further along the plate the wind flows. If we plot the upper margins of the boundary layers along the plate's characteristic dimension, we see that the thickness of the boundary layer, indicated by the yellow brackets, increases up to a point where the boundary layer is fully developed. Upstream from that, that is, from the leading edge of the plate back, the boundary layer is said to be developing. Theoretically, the boundary layer is only fully developed when the characteristic length of the plate approaches infinity. In the real world, there's no such thing as an infinitely long surface, although some surfaces, like open fields or stream beds, come close to having fully developed boundary layers. Rather, we're interested in boundary layers that develop around smaller things, on organismal size, say. So, for example, a leaf can act as a plate, similar to what we have just outlined. The boundary layer is very important to the function of the leaf, and it limits not only momentum transfer, but also transfer of things like heat and water vapor exchange between the leaf and atmosphere. Boundary layers in these instances are rarely fully developed. This means there are a lot of complicated things that go into the shape and thickness of a boundary layer. One very strong influence on boundary layer thickness is wind speed. Imagine that we have a plate as described above, with wind at a speed of v sub fs, flowing parallel to the surface. The developing boundary layer is given by the orange dashed line, and it has a particular thickness, t sub bl. Now, imagine the same plate, but with a reduced wind speed. Slower wind speed will produce a thicker boundary layer. Why? Well, there's a whole mathematics of this, but intuitively it's pretty easy to understand why. Slower wind speed means less momentum to transfer, shallower velocity gradients overall, and therefore a thicker boundary layer. What we can say is that wind speed will affect boundary layer in the following ways. High wind speed will result in thinner boundary layers, which will be accompanied by higher shear rates within the boundary layer and higher shear stresses. This will result in higher transfer of momentum between the wind and the plate at higher wind speeds, and, if this is relevant, higher rates of heat and mass transfer. Another important influence on the boundary layer is the characteristic dimension. Imagine that we now have a short plate, with S drastically reduced. This puts the boundary layer well within its developing phase, and, as a result, the boundary layer will be much thinner. Again, there's a whole mathematics behind this. We're not going to be bothering with that. We simply will be adding shorter length to the criteria that affect boundary layer thickness. Namely, shorter length will have the same effect as higher wind speed, producing thinner boundary layers, higher shear rates, and the rest. The boundary layer is the fundamental mode of interaction between organisms and their fluid environment. The boundary layer is complicated in theory, but it's not hard to understand in practice. 
One does have to be cognizant of the things that cause boundary layers to vary, but understanding how living things interact with their fluid environments can be understood with just a few simple rules of thumb. The main sources of variation in the boundary layer are variations of wind speed and the characteristic dimension of the object involved. High winds can make for thin boundary layers and therefore high rates of transfer of momentum, heat, and mass between the organism and environment. Small things generally have thinner boundary layers than do large things, and this can result in higher rates of transfer of momentum, heat, and mass. There's also an issue of what kind of flow is involved. An example of this is turbulence, which can affect boundary layers significantly. We haven't considered turbulence yet, but we will be getting into that issue in a subsequent lecture. For now, however, take a look at this video on leaf temperature. Leaves are an awful lot like the plates that we've been discussing here, and the video looks at how boundary layers affect leaf temperature. This video explores many of the issues that we've outlined here in this lecture. So before you go on to the next lecture, take a few minutes and look at that leaf temperature video.